Hi, good evening, and thank you all for coming. Aloha and welcome. My name is Christine Botros, and I'm the Associate Director for Learning and Engagement here at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Uh, thank you for coming to our talk with Neil Chapman, Scent, the Language of Flowers. Um, firstly, I would like to thank many perfume houses, and I would just, there it is, <laughs> many of the perfume houses across the globe who have supported this program, um, as well as the home of Village and community to make this event. Many thanks to our teams in communications and design programs and events. Um, I'd also like to thank Neil's team, Sue Busto, who uh, is also a fragrance writer, publicist and consultant, and Duncan Hume, who is uh, sitting here in the uh, audience. Um, I hope that many of you have taken the opportunity to explore our exhibitions, Cross Pollination, Flowers Across the Collection, which is located in Gallery 28. Uh, in conjunction with our immersive installation, Rebecca Louise Law Awakening in galleries 12 and 13. You may notice the fragrance that permeates through the galleries down the elevator as you me meander through Awakening. And when you roam through cross-pollination, you may also notice the painting um, Fragrance by Hans Hoffman, where one may see the translation of scent coming through the visual realm. So to build on these olfactory dimensions, we have invited Neil Chapman to Homer to speak on perhaps one of our most mysterious of senses, smell, and the role that scent plays. So Neil is based in uh, Kamakura, Japan, and is a British writer and educator who's been fascinated by perfume since he was a child. Described by the Japan Times as having a distinguished nose of, of an olfactory detective, <laughs> Japan is the winner, um, sorry, Chapman is the winner of the Fragrance Foundation's prestigious 2014 Jasmine Literary Award for Fragrance Writing. Um, he's also the author of Perfume in Search of Your Signature Scent and a regular contributor to Vogue Japan. Uh, he's been writing for the blog The Black Narcissus, an exploration of perfume and the experience of smell since 2012. So please welcome Neil Chapman onto the stage. So thank you very much for having me and for coming tonight. I'm a bit nervous because I'm not really used to a big theatre like this, but it's very exciting. <laughs> and this is, this is probably the most perfumed I've ever been in my life, I think. Like, it, it's, it's pretty strong, isn't it? It's hardcore. Yes. The, the hardcore <laughs> white flowers. I, I love white flowers, but I've never had this many. And up this close, it's quite stunning. Am we I wearing it okay? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This, you know the cultural significance very well. Yeah. But. It's a celebratory thing, isn't it? Well, thanks for being here, Neil. I'm delighted to be yeah. here. Yeah. So thank you. I love the um, museum. I may, I may get to a point where I might ask you to remove that if, because um, I do have allergies. <laughs> so. Yeah, so th this whole setup is very ironic, actually, because you've got a serious perfume hater. Well, uh, okay. Let's. <laughs> okay. Someone who can't tolerate perfumes and someone who practically drinks them. Well, I, so that's why we're sitting yes. quite far apart, because it's, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I literally might have to take it off. Yes. Is it, it's true, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, it is true. So Yours is unscented completely, isn't it? Mine is completely unscented. <laughs> yeah, mine's very scented. <laughs> well, okay, so can we just start well, with, um, well, the reason why we brought you here is because you are a writer of perfumes. Right, yeah. So can you tell us, like, what led you to, to write about scent? Well, I've loved it since I, since I was a kid, and when I was a... Uh, a teenager, people always said I should write because I used to write really long letters, like 30 page letters from wherever I was to people, like, you know, crazy long letters. But I couldn't find my topic. And I'm, I can't really do fiction because there's too much in life already to write about. And then one day I, uh, I was sitting at, at my desk at work. I teach Japanese students. And I just, just suddenly decided to see if I could write a description of this perfume. Mitsuko, as a challenge to myself. And so I just sat and wrote it. And then I finished it and thought, yeah, it, it does pretty much capture most of what the scent is about. And then from there I started writing, um, well, the first thing I did actually it was called The Menu. So I did uh, a menu of all the perfumes in the house. And then when guests came for dinner, 
after dinner instead of dessert. I'd say, okay, let's choose a perfume. <laughs> and I would hand out the menu, <laughs> and then they would choose something. I'd run off and get it. And then that turned into a book idea eventually, expanded into the full, the full book idea. So you started with the blog, The Black yeah, Narcissist, in right. 2012. That's right. Okay, and then it went to? It turned into that, okay. yeah, which is quite something. Can I, so I just wanted to ask about the cover here because it's a beautiful image. Yes. And well, it was, I probably can't talk about this, can I? It was a, a big battle with the publisher. They had a horrible pastel, like pink, yellow, kind of tapir shaped, grotesque cover. <laughs> and um, I basically said, there's absolutely no way in hell that's going, my name is going on that. And my mother happens to, my mother loves uh, Art Deco, and she has a bottle exactly like that. In, so it was kind of a homage to her, really. So when they saw the book, my parents were just, they slept with it for about three days. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, they were, my son has done this. And they took it to bed at night and couldn't get over it, you know. They, they didn't like the writing that much, but they, uh, <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit too florid for my parents. I, I'm actually really intrigued by the way it's organised. So can you tell us a little bit about the scent wheel and how that came about? So I kind of thought that um, like if you go past uh, Duty Free or any department store, it doesn't actually smell very nice, I think. So a lot of perfumes... Agreed. Actually, it's, just, <laughs> it's just like a miasma of like chemical things swirling around. It's very confusing. and it, I wanted to do something which could like lead some people into it make it more relatable, because everyone knows like, what mint smells like or what a hyacinth smells like or what vanilla smells like. So I decided to make this kind of taxonomy of like a scent spectrum where you begin in the grass, a bit like Dante in the, in the forest. And it progresses progress through like, uh, fresh flowers and citruses. It goes into all, all, the, all the flowers divided into sections by sections. And then Classics like num number five, like classic aldehydes. It gets gradually heavier and sweeter, goes through like incense and gourmand perfumes, and then, sorry, gourmand, and then meditative, like forest perfumes, and then comes out in the ocean, and then you're back to the grass again. So to me, it made sense. So that was my original. Sorry? Anti-perfume? Yes, can oh, you tell yes. us about the anti-perfume futuristic? Okay, so yeah, that's not a traditional, like, that's my title. Uh -huh. But, like, in 1994, the perfumer Christopher Brosius, who founded uh, a perfume called I Hate Perfume, which is, which is quite a funny name for a perfume company. So he was a taxi driver in New York, and he thought that the people in, in the taxi smelled horrendous. <laughs> So he decided to do like a completely break with all the traditions and he founded his company and his first, I think his first perfume was dirt, which actually does smell like, literally smells like earth. And there's I one called the smell earthworm, of earth. earthworm as well, if you want to smell like an earthworm. So that, that couldn't fit into the, you know, the traditional categories. A lot of anti-perfume is like, it's quite, uh, it's quite provocative. It's like deliberately trying to break through, you know, smelling pretty or just smelling sexy. It's about um, smelling how you want to smell. It's quite interesting, actually. Can you give me, a, give us an example of someone anti who has produced of an, yeah, an anti-perfume? Uh, well, I mean, my partner Duncan, he does, does like uh, performance art at this event, which uh, Skylar also goes to, and I perform at too. And uh, he was doing a piece about snakes. And I decided to add an olfactory dimension to it. So he was, wearing, uh, he was wearing Black March, which really does smell like, it smells like I see desolate fields, just you know, covered in ice. It's quite miserable, it's quite, it's quite disturbing. And I combined that with a, a sort of hissy green perfume from the 70s called Silence, Silence. So when Duncan came on, it really kind of three-dimensionalized the whole piece, you know, because there was the mus musical aspect, the visual aspect, and like it, it felt physically colder because the, the perfume had that really like impactful, it was quite, it made the whole atmosphere quite sinister, actually. I mean, I wouldn't wear Black March, 
And if you went to work, you'd be booted out of the office, I think. Because it's, uh, <laughs> you know, who is this zombie-like creep who's feeling, who's, I mean, it has its limits, in my opinion, and it can get boring. I'm a, I'm a little bit bored of it all. Okay. It, but you, you've, you've come onto something here. So, because many, many of us consider perfume just to be something, you know, something that we just wear. Yeah. Um, something to wear to smell nice. Yeah. Um, it is something more. I mean. You know, is it art? Wow, that's a big question. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people just use it as a kind of, uh, just an afterthought. You know, like I've, I've got dressed and then just grabbed the perfume, which someone gave you for Christmas or which you picked up at duty free randomly. And they just spray it on just to cover up something and just to smell pleasant. But I think it can be so much more than that. It can be more trans, you know, transformative. You can, you can accentuate parts of your personality that you want to show or you can disguise them. You can uh, present different faces to the world. It can be a lot more um, intriguing and like enigmatic than just something from Sephora which you haven't thought about very deeply. As to whether it's art, I think, I mean, I think it is. And if people say it's not, it's probably because they, the sense of, smell, sense of smell itself is not as respected as much as the other senses. Like in the kind of hierarchy of the senses, it's considered uh, lower in some way, like kind of animalistic. It doesn't get the same like credit that other senses get. Um, what do you think about whether it's art? I've been learning a lot from you, Neil, about scent. Yep. Um, and, you know, as someone who, who has to stay away from a lot of chemicals and, and, yeah. and smells. Um, and, yeah, so, I, I, you know, you see this layering happening, this um, very painterly, artistic... It is painterly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because expression the yeah. occurring yes. through, yeah, yeah. through these... Through these I scents mean, uh, and how they put, are put together. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the traditional uh, way of becoming a perfumer, it takes about six or seven years, the same as it would for like a, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or any kind of artisan uh, to be trained properly. They use a palette of you know, materials like a painter and they, the ingredients are described as notes. I mean, the, the actual detailed composition of any perfume is like sheet music in a way. It's there for posterity, you know. It's like the Guerlain vaults in Paris, they have the recipes locked away. But if you were to get the exact ingredients and the proportions, you could recreate them in the same way as you can, you know, play a Beethoven sonata. And actually in one place I'd really like to go to one day is the Osmotec in Versailles. I've never been there. Osmo is smell, tech is like stories, like, you know, like bibliotech. It's the one museum in, in, in the world which has, um, has perfumes kept as though they were, you know, Da Vinci's or something like that. They're kept in all the perfect atmospheric temperatures. They've, they're either the actual original perfumes, which they've preserved, or they've been painstakingly recreated using the exact ingredients, the same materials, you know, as close as possible to the original recipes. And you can go there and you can smell them. It's free of charge, apparently. It's, it's seen as like, you know, France's cultural heritage you know, in a similar way to the Louvre. So from that point of view, like, um, I think it can be considered art for sure. Also, it, you know, I mean, anything which transforms you and, sorry, transports your emotions and changes you in some way, aesthetically, which is what perfume does, it can be considered art, in my opinion. If dance is art, I think perfume is art, or at least an art. So you've had an opportunity to look at our... Um current exhibitions, yeah. and you're making those kind of connections. Um, do you mind if I quote you here? I'm going no, to be sure. quoting you a lot tonight, if that's okay. So in this instance, um, you went into the Noah Harder's um, exhibition, which is in Gallery 14. Yeah. <clears throat> and we're talking yeah. about to dream. And you had talked about how often scent has that effect and something that had come up and you had written about in the past so I'm just going to read this out if that's okay. Um, there are some of us certainly more lost to dreams or giving in to that impulse to escape into anywhere other than hard facts, railway tracks, and the ticking of the clock. Did I write that? You did write that, okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're writing it in She's reference. mined my blog. I'm not quite sure what, like, I write loads. Of, God knows what I'm writing half the time. <laughs> um, and you're writing it in reference to Parfums Dusita, am I saying that correctly, which is a Thai-based... Yes, yes. Yes. Um, 
And you're saying itself is based, it seems to me, on similar ideas about giving or not giving into the dream. So what did you see in Noah's work that I felt really was connecting to um, something that you have written about in the past? Well, I mean, he's trying to almost become like a man flower, man flower or a flower man. I mean, he's, he's written about disguising himself, I think. Like, he feels more beautiful with these masks on. And I think it's, there's definitely a parallel with perfume and wanting to escape into like a dreamlike state, which perfume can do. I mean, I think that uh, like flowers, like they fascinate people to the point, point where you almost want to be them, I think. That's probably why like, in, you know, like in the Greek myths, there are so many stories of like, um, like powerful emotions of you know, love and lust, which are so like unbearable, almost like you know, paroxysms of um, desire to the point where the human being dies and then gets turned into a flower forever, you know? And that I think there's a, a sort of deep compulsion with humans to either like collect flowers or, you know, like represent them or physically possess the juice of them, you know, and like then wear it on the skin. That's what I feel like. So I, he's, he's um, it's a kind of non-olfactory parallel with perfume, I think, visual. So we also went into Rebecca Louise Law's yep. um, installation. <clears throat> and um, so before I say anything, can I just ask you, just off the bat, what were yep. your sensory uh, impressions? I felt quite childlike in there. Like, it reminded me of hay and, like, like, and they smell, they don't smell like flowers, right? They smell like, they're dried flowers. They smell like hay. I, it was very... A charming pastoral kind of quaint feeling of being on like school trips or uh, you know I, I mean I used to dry dry flowers myself as a child and actually this this coming here today it's a kind of um, vindication for me in a way because when I was uh, like nine years old my parents put me in the Cub Scouts or they asked me if I wanted to join the Cub Scouts and I didn't really want to because I didn't like anything about it but I joined anyway <laughs> I didn't like any of the act activities um, except I quite like staying in the wigwam in the forest because I like being, you know, staying in a forest at night. But what I did do um, to get uh, the craft badge, I collected loads of plants and flowers and I made a scrapbook and I painstakingly wrote all the details about it. And then I presented it to the so-called Arcalers, which is the, the leaders of the, the, the Cub Scout, and they laughed in my face. They really, like like really made fun of me and uh, humiliated me. And I felt like really ashamed. I'd done something so kind of, you know, effeminate and poncy and, you know, like, it was a real eye opener to, you know, how the world can be quite rough. So I sort of learned, you know, like boys can't like flowers. And it was quite traumatizing for me. Um, fortunately, <clears throat> my parents uh, like didn't try to, I mean, their interests are different, different from mine, but they let me go my way. So I used to read the flower fairy books, like sitting in the garden. I mean, do you know the flower fairies? They're so charming. Like, they're a bit corny now when I read the, the poems, but the actual pictures are so lovely. Like, um, and I really identified with the flower fairies. I, mean, I was uh, Peter Pan in the school play, and I actually looked like one of the flower fairies. <laughs> Not now, but the, <laughs> when I was a, you know, a, a tiny nine-year-old, whatever. And uh, so in a way, you know, to have survived that, kind of sense of shame, and then for all this to happen and to be here is like a really quite moving for me, to be honest. So, so thank you for making it happen. Yeah, um, so I think uh, she's also like, you know, obsessed with flowers and um, just slightly, she has like a million, doesn't she? I think there were a million pieces, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> And there's something very like gossamer-like and very fragile about the way they're, they're hanging. I thought the, the last part was especially beautiful, the, the pink, you know, the, it kind of reminds me of like the, the wisteria festivals in Japan, because oh. they, they have whole parks which are de uh, dedicated to the wisteria, which hangs down like that. And it looks incredible, and it smells absolutely incredible, because Japanese people really appreciate flowers. You know, they go on bus, long bus journeys to visit one particular flower in one particular place. It's, Oh, that's the Osmanthus tree outside my house. So oh. we have the, uh, do you have Osmanthus in Japan? You've got every flower imaginable, I think, don't you? 
Do you have osmanthus? I don't think there is. Okay, it smells, it, it smells exactly like uh, apricots, like, or like an apricot um, yogurt tea. It's almost creamy, and it blossoms like, like, like clockwork on October the 1st every year. And it's very beautiful. It gets quite strong. <laughs> it's right outside the house. But anyway, so I think I, yeah, I brought this up because um, I was making reference because we talked a lot about memory as well yeah. when we were walking through um, Rebecca's work, and I mean you've brought up a really hard experience yeah, and me. memory for you, um, but you also at the end of last year I was I was again reading your blog and I just loved how you brought up these really beautiful twenty two memories for. Of 2022. 22 olfactory memories. Yes, memory. and I loved it. I loved and I loved number nine especially. Um, and you did make reference to the um, osmanthus tree. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I was really curious about it and what it, and you know what it does smell like. You've just described, but mm. yeah. I mean, I think I mean coming here, it's stunning. There's flowers everywhere, and I'm kind of, you know I don't even know what they are. Most of them. It's really like a proper eye opener for me. Um, but in Japan, they flower and then die, and then the next ones come. And they're real like signifiers of the seasons, you know. So that's definitely October. Then you go through a quite a bleak, cold, uh, wintry period, and that's when the narcissus comes up at, around like the end of uh, December, the beginning of January, and the plum blossom, which is uh, ume, which is it's very piercing and melancholy. If you're like walking in a really icy, cold night, and it's very, you know, it feels like there's no, it feels like there's no hope anywhere, and then you suddenly smell this like wistful, beautiful. Plum blossom singing in the air, you know, it's, it's really heartrending. So that is like, uh, yeah, summer is a bit like Hawaii. There's lilies everywhere. They, they kind of, uh, they stain you when you cycle past, you know. Um, yeah. Um, so moving Sorry. into cross pollination. Yeah. Um, and I brought up the um, Van Thielen's piece here, which I think you had commented on earlier this week, but um, the carnation. Oh, yes. Yes. So I love I'm, carnation. So I'm really, um, because something that you wrote about, um, about the carnation is how unpopular it is. It's kind of uncool. I mean, like, you know, like, if you buy carnation bouquets from, like, the gas stand, it's kind of like a, a last-minute Mother's Day memory, like, you know, damn, much. Isn't, isn't it? In England, anyway, they're, they're not really, like, Classy, you know. Um, is it the same in Hawaii or in, in America? It doesn't have a very good image in most people's eyes. It's kind of a bit kind of. It's what, sorry? You bring it to. A oh funeral. yes, yes, yes. That could be it. Like chrysanthemums as well. Yeah. Yeah, but they actually smell really beautiful because of the clothy aspect. Yeah, but as you um, right now because of the. Um, the International Fragrance uh, Association. I mean, quite rightly, they've restricted a lot of ingredients, which could be possibly sensitizing for some people. Mm. Like you said, you're allergic to. You've had the patch test. Yes, I have had the patch test, and yeah, the um, the compound that is in the um, carnation. Um, eugenol, is, yeah. Yes, which is the, the eugenol, which is the yes, clove, I, spicy clove mm -hmm. scent, which is mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So keep that away from me. It's basically. Well, it's basic. <laughs> Well, it has been restricted, so you can't really make good carnation perfumes anymore. You can't make clovey perfumes anymore. You can't make uh, Lily of the Valley perfumes anymore very well. It's kind of, it, yeah, you can't. And the, the amount of rose is restricted, the amount of lemon is restricted, bergamot is restricted. Um, I personally, I understand why they have to do it, but I think it should be more like, you know, if you can't eat peanuts, don't eat peanuts. Like if, if you do have a reaction to it, then don't worry. But if most people don't have a reaction, then I, I'm not sure it should be banned. If it's toxic, for sure, they're right to ban it. But if it's only an irritant for some people, I think it's perhaps they should leave it open to the individual to decide if they want to work, try it or not. So my favorite carnation perfume is no longer available. It used to be. It was incredible. It was by Santa Maria Novella, and it was like, it, admittedly, it did slightly burn. <laughs> So I slightly suffer for my art, to be honest. Like, it did a, a little bit, because it's so, like, potent. <laughs> no, but you, like, with an open shirt, it was like, I felt like, uh, like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. It was like, it just, you could strut through the town in this carnation smell. 
And the carnations keep blooming on you. It, it went on for hours and hours and hours. It was absolutely beautiful. You can't get it anymore. You've, you've truly suffered for the art. I have. Shalimar, I shouldn't be saying this, because but Shalimar is one of my absolute favorite perfumes of all time, but sometimes the lemon can burn a bit. But then lemon oil does that to me anyway, like lemon essential oil burns. So um, I don't know. It's up for debate, that topic. I think they shouldn't mess with the classics too much, right. but the public should be kept safe, of course. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I chose this particular piece from Cross Pollination um, because you had mentioned to me your love for wisteria. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, so, and I just really love this description that you have in the Black, Na Black Narcissus. The wisteria tree at the station smells so bloody gorgeous, like a phenomenal hit of stargazer lilies, stocks, Lilacs and purple jasmine that I swear it just <sighs> made my pupils dilate. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I embarrass myself like, uh, <laughs> because this is kind of over the top. But if you've just been to work and you've been like a, in an odorless environment, where I work in Japan, uh, this is very ironic, uh, we're not allowed to wear perfume. It's in the rules. So, yeah, you're not allowed to. You have to try and be as odorless as possible because. That's it's... why I love visiting. <laughs> um, so you've had like a very rational day of you know like teaching, and then you suddenly come out into where I live, and it's it is literally like that. It does make me delirious. I don't know if my people's actually dilated, but they may have done. And I did have like a like oh my god, and it changes everything. You forget you forget the sort of sordid realities, and I think the perfumes just take you to a different realm, you know, like a, like a heavenly realm or something, something not quite in the in a. And they just hang down wild from the, from the mountains. You know, it's beautiful. I love it. Can you talk mm. a little bit more about cross-pollination? So, I mean, not our exhibition per se, but just that, um, just that terminology, because I think it plays um, an important part. Or even that description. Into perfume? In, in, with perfume, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, traditionally, you know, with the Silk Road and the, ancient, the ancients were, you know, transporting frankincense and myrrh and spices left, right and center. And we kind of think sometimes that's all over now and doesn't exist anymore. But actually, I think the lay is too much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you okay with it? I'm fine. I'm, okay? I'm doing okay. Go. <laughs> now what I mean is, okay, so like um, a lot of the cheaper, like um, mainstream perfumes, they are cheapening and cheapening by the year. They're using fewer and fewer natural ingredients. If they can get a cheap uh, substitute for a, a natural oil, they will. And it's actually quite sad because um, a lot of um, communities around the world, in every part of the world you can think of, depend on selling their extracts of oils to perfume companies. Like, uh, for example, in uh, like frankincense, most of frankincense comes from Somalia. And Arabia, and it's it's made in exactly the same way as it was, you know, before the Bible. Myrrh is the same. So, like, you know, there are tribes who have their own tree, and the tree belongs to them, and they sell their myrrh to churches and mosques and different religions that use incense. And patchouli is made in still made in Indonesia, and vanilla is made in Madagascar. And perfume actually is an an act of pollination, you know, cross pollination. You've got all of these like original plant ingredients being harvested very, very carefully. You've got middle, middle people who buy them and then sell them to niche perfume companies especially. And so when it's all blended together, I think it is actually, like truly is actual cross-pollination you know, in a way. So I think that's why it's important to be aware of, like not be seduced by the, by the advertising. You know? Just because it's Johnny Depp doesn't mean you have to buy Sauvage. You can, uh, Sauvage is fine. It's sexy in a way, but um, I think there are more interesting, like, more beautifully made perfumes which are available, which um, people should explore. One sad thing is, for example, like, um, vanilla is very popular today. And um, I love vanilla. And so we went on an agricultural trip to, we were going to go to Madagascar, but there was a plague of locusts, which a real, like, biblical level of, you know, you couldn't even walk. So we, we cancelled, and I looked for an alternative place to study vanilla, 
One option was Tahiti, which was, would have been lovely, but we decided to, in the end to go to Java and we stayed on an organic vanilla plantation uh, in Java. So we got to see how real vanilla is made. It was, it was absolutely fascinating, like that, the entire process. We stayed with the family, we were on the fields and I didn't get to see the, the orchid bloom, unfortunately, because it only blooms, I think it's one day. And uh, the act has to be hand pollinated. Oh. Yes, because it, originally it was, um, it was done in Mexico. They're from Mexico originally, but the, the bees don't exist in Madagascar and other countries. So it has to be human pollinated. And we got to smell the, the leaf, the, the vanilla beans like drying in the, the loft and the smell was unbelievable, but it's very, co very complex. It's, uh, smoky, tobacco-y, quite, quite an unusual smell. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is, is that people now, when they, when they think of vanilla, they're, they're actually thinking of vanillin, which is the synthetic version of vanilla. So when you buy a vanilla perfume, you're not really actually smelling actual mm -hmm. vanilla. So real vanilla would probably freak people out mm -hmm. because, it's too, it's, because it's too complex and it's too, it keeps you know, mutating and changing. It's, it's got many different facets to it. Like real sandalwood is absolutely exquisite. Um, but now synthetic sandalwoods are being used instead and they're just not the same. They don't take you to the same place as the originals. So my, my good friend, uh, Darius Alavi, who does the Persiles blog, it's one of the best perfume blogs. He's doing a series right now um, called, uh, I think it's called Masterclass. And he's doing interviews with people who are involved with the process of getting the oils from, whether it be, you know, orange in Paraguay or, or uh, specific lavender in France, you know, and uh, so he's trying, he's trying to raise awareness about, uh, you know, protecting the farm, farmer's livelihood, like vetiver in Haiti, like Haiti's main uh, export is vetiver oil. So yeah, can we, can we dig a little bit more about into the perfume industry? Um, because it, you know, perfume has a, um, a mysterious, evocative it does yeah right persona definitely right but i think there's a dirty side to the whole industry can you in what sense well okay can we demystify a little bit more i mean can without we, without mystique you wouldn't we, really have perfume because you need i mean yeah it's the whole thing has become demystified because of uh people like me <laughs> no because um no because i should talk about what perfume writing is um like before 1992 no one wrote about perfume. The only, the only, if there was a new perfume like, you know, Dior Poison or something like that, you just had the woman with the bottle, you know, and then Dior Poison. And, and the rest was left to your imagination, you know? It, it, it was genuinely quite full of mystique. Um, in 1992, Luca Turin, who's a kind of genius, like biochemist and uh, brilliant writer, he wrote per a guide about perfumes. And after that, many people jumped on the boat like me and started writing about it. And um, I think it's, in some ways, it's, it may have demystified it to some extent, but at the same time, it's allowed a proliferation of like, interest in it. And because of the, the perfume blogs and the writers, I think um, niche perfume ha has been allowed to grow because niche perf perfumers don't really advertise. Mm. There's all word of mouth. So if it's, a, if it's actually a good smell, not just based on the advertising, it gets the buzz and then it gets, it becomes popular. But um, in terms of popular perfume, I don't, I'm not that, I mean, some of it's fine. I mean, it's like, how can I say? It's like a Marvel movie. Marvel movies are good. Uh -huh. They're very well made. They're consumer researched. They've got sexy actors. They've got all the ingredients. Uh -huh. And I don't mind the other one. I like Joker. Um, however, you wouldn't always want to wear watch a Marvel movie maybe, you know. So I think the niche industry is like, is, is more like an independent cinema in a way. Um, yeah, talking about Dior, so um, between 1947, when Miss Dior came out, and 1999, when they made, when Jador came out, I think Christian Dior had uh, 18 perfumes in total. Mm -hmm. So they're releasing one every two or three years. And then, but in like between 2021 and 2022, they had 18 perfumes came out from the same house. So they're releasing more and more and more and more. 
more and more flankers of you know, existing perfumes, like ver you know, versions of, and I do think the quality has gone down. Because when, when I was growing up, like a new perfume, it was like, uh, it was like a Kubrick movie or you know, a Scorsese movie or something. They were under wraps, the project was, no one knew what was gonna happen. It was in development and it was you know, very, very um, properly created. And then it came out and it could be like a, a real game changer. But now they're just generic. Um, they're just, you know, perfume is going more and more generic, I think. So <clears throat> you are, well, I've heard you being referred to as the vintage queen. <laughs> and a collector vintage of, vin queen. yes, collector of per uh, vintage perfumes. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> and, um, I mean <laughs> hopefully not exclusively that, because that would be a, a bit kind of, you know, aging. Um, <laughs> But uh, I do, yes, because in, in Japan, they have a lot of flea markets and recycle shops, they call, uh, or antique shops, and they are full of like cardiac arrest inducing, mm. like pristine uh, vintage perfumes, which no one's ever used. So like, you know, in the, in, the, in the heyday of travel in the 60s or 70s, people would go to Paris and they'd see like a, you know, a perfume, Yves Saint Laurent perfume, or in the, the boutiques of Paris, and they bring it back as a souvenir, because the Omiyage culture, you know, giving souvenirs to people. And then someone would, ah, thank you very much. And like, it would be like, it, it's, <laughs> because they have a lot of respect for objects and for things in general, they, it would be treated as like, a, almost like a revered Parisian artifact, which they're delighted to receive, but never open it, because they don't intend on wearing it. And then it gets into my greedy hands. <laughs> when, I, when I find it in the flea markets, they're like, I mean, really, it does almost sometimes induce a heart attack because it can be absolutely incredible. It's drying up now because the su supply is naturally, you know, it's reached, it, it's, uh, it can't go on forever. It's a bit like oil. But, um, but. <laughs> Well, can I, can I ask you something? So tomorrow you're doing a scent appreciation workshop for That's us. Right. And you've brought with you 200 scents, yeah. vintage scents. With, can yes, I, I got tendonitis from uh, like spraying the little vials and uh, li literally <laughs> and doing the labels like because that, that, that action it really can like so my partner was doing a lot of the spraying yeah we did we got a, a wide selection to take the, the uh, participants through different different kinds of fragrances so what's the oldest one that you're bringing with you or that you've brought with you uh well i think the Eau de Cologne Imperial by Galin is like 1860, but obviously it's not, it's not actually, that's not an 1860 edition. It's a, I think it's a 1960s edition, but it, the original came out in 1860. I bought some stuff from a very rare Jean Patou from like 1929, Moment Supreme, which is kind of actually in the Osmotech in Versailles. I mean, it does smell a little, it, I mean, it, does, it doesn't smell modern. It does smell a bit musty. It does, no, no, but it's also very melancholy and it's quite, um, has a kind of poetic tenderness to it, which you don't get from just something very brash, you know, like it, current, I, I, I think people sh should find it quite interesting, I think. But I'm not doing exclusively vintage, I'm doing a mix of different kinds of things. Can we talk about the descriptions, description of sense, which I find really fascinating. Um, and again, I keep using the word evocative because there's a lot of evocative language that perhaps one, one reads and, and maybe at times um, these descriptions can be, um, well, can go unnecessarily overboard. I can't comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, no, it's a, it is a fine line because, because, you know, sometimes how much it, is it about the perfume and how much is it about the writer? I and mean, there is some narcissism involved in it. Um, but at Is least that I, part of the art? But at least I can string a sentence together. Okay. <laughs> I mean, some of the, some of the um, descriptions you get are so bad. Like, like a chat robot would, be, would do a much better job. You know, chatbot, are they called chatbot? Those, those oh, the, chat, the chatbot. Yeah. These stingy companies can't even you know, afford a decent translator. They just run it through a Google Translate and total gobbledygook comes out. So like long come uh, la vie est belle which is the, one of the top perfumes in the world. Their tagline in English was a, a tasty iris, <laughs> which is garbage. 
I mean, you know, they could at least try and find a nice, uh, you know, expression in English or something. Do you have anything with I, with I you did. that you can share with us that you... Is it legal to do that? We, we just won't name it. Okay. Okay. Uh, do I really want to read this? Um, lusty moans whisper through milky sheets, back and forth, accompanied by a calm, familiar synergy of warm skin. Never cared what others think, did you? It feels raw and undoubtedly satisfying. And this one as well. Um, I don't think it really makes sense, does it? The smallest... The smallest tinsel of heavy silence precedes a hot slingshot of fiery sensual pleasure. A abuser bites deep and hard on the ridges of your senses and does not let go until it explores the very depths of your soul. It's in the muscular tenses of a mysterious hostess or in the dandy smiles of a gypsy valet. <laughs> Opening your door to a dreamy realm. But actually, this company... I wouldn't name them. I mean, no, 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 no. I, yeah, I'm, I have given one. Um, no, that's a good one. <laughs> you can erase it later. No, that was good. I gave it to a friend. He, he did like it. But some of the um, the tagline is perfumes to numb your senses, which is quite ironic, I think. <laughs> no, because a lot of perfume right now it's as it's as uh, as subtle as like a you know a sledgehammer to the back of the head. To be honest, um, don't you think so? Like. Yeah. It's just too strong. It's not enjoyable. There's no, there's no like, there's no mystery. And there's no subtlety in it. There's no like development. It's just like one note, synthetic, aromachemical, woody, aggressive. Mm. I really don't like it at all. I don't like it. Yeah. So yeah. So it, just to, just to finish about that, it says this is it says um, imagine these people wearing these perfumes and the uh, future lovers depart from both ends of the street with teen thrills suffocating their throats. It's not, it doesn't really make you want to buy it, does it? <laughs> and that is, there are plenty of, I mean, that's a <laughs> They wrote that. And so when it's translated from French or Italian or German, it can get really like pure gobbledygook, mm. which I think is uh, at least, yeah, at least I can, you know, basically write, I think. What was your question about? Um, I'm sorry, what about, is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got a bit off topic. Sorry. I mean, is, is, the, is the story important? Sorry. Like, do we need to have these kind of descriptions? Well, as I said before, it used to be just an advert, and you smelled it, and either you liked it or you didn't. Because perfumes, in, you know, from like the beginning of the century to, I would say, the 90s, they were designed to be like your perfume for life. You know, like, you know, if your mother wore number five, she wore number five forever. She might sometimes go to a different perfume. They were that good that once they hooked you in, it didn't matter what anyone said about it. You, it was, you just liked that smell. But now there's so much, so much out there. There are hundreds of thousands of perfumes and new releases all the time. That I think for it to like make sense to people, you need to have some kind of story. Like in my case, I smell something and then I relate it to something that's going on around me at that moment. Uh, it could be my in my personal life. It could be in politics. It could be in cinema. It could be anything. And I think it kind of coalesces into something where the perfume becomes like part of the the anecdote or, you know, the diary entry, if you like. And I think people can relate to that more than, you know, the teenage suffocation. Uh, <laughs> I try to make it a bit relatable. I mean, I do go over the top sometimes, but I mean, you know, perfume is poetry, and I think it's nice to keep the poetic in it still, mm. I think. Before we were talking about memory, right? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Oh, sorry, should I not stray that? <laughs> Some, yes, some, talk, talk some, people, some people in the know are laughing already <laughs> about memory. Mm. I do think that the mem that memory is the is really the strongest aspect of mm. of perfume. I, I mean, like um, recently, Prince Harry was I think he was talking to if it was Oprah or somebody about um, the situation, you know. And um, he actually, when he goes to his therapy sessions to talk about his mother, he takes uh, Van Cleef and Apples first which is actually my mother's perfume too, unbelievably. But he takes it into the therapy sessions because just that bottle brings her back more than anything, anything else could. I mean, she's in the room with him, and it's very, it's, it must be very sad and very, very cathartic. 
Um, but I do think that, um, like, my perfume collection is like a, it's like a, a library of liquid memory. So I, I can go back to any spot. I mean, this is going to, I mean, this, I'm going to keep this forever. <laughs> It'll probably lose its smell. And, you know, no, no, really, I love it. I'll have my, you know, my own Rebecca Law in my uh, hanging down. Um, but I, I think that, um, I mean, any scent, any smell can take you back to your childhood, of course. It doesn't have to be perfume. It could be anything. It could be, like for me, uh, beetroot and carrot salad reminds me of being on my first day at school when I, I was locked out of the canteen and I was too timid to push the door. And I just stood there and then I went home and said, Mum, I didn't have any, any lunch. She said, what? And um, the smell of the, that particular combination of vegetable takes you back to that memory, but it's not a beautiful memory. So, I mean, smell itself is connected to the memory, but if you have a memory which is then interlaced with a really beautiful aesthetic, you know, pleasurable odor, mm. then I think perfume, you know, really tops any other scent for that, you know, because it's, once, you, once you've made that link, you don't, you never forget it. You can't forget it, even if you want to forget it. If you smell it again, you will go back to it, you know. Are we going on to gender now? Yes, can we talk about gender? Um, well, okay. Yeah, because, I mean... Not yet. Yes, oh, not okay. yet? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> My parents will disown me, I think. <laughs> um, you know, because when I think of sense, or in the past, you know, you look at... It's very gendered. Well, very, it feels very, very gendered, you know. So, how are we breaking those stereotypes well, and can the is the industry in many ways we're not breaking it because it's still blue for boys and pink for girls it really mm. is like the, the current trends are cotton candy florals for women and very macho like fougere like cl the classic barbershop sauvage is a good example of that it's very well very well made perfume mm. i have a friend who wears it. it smells quite good but it's it's a little bit Brutal in terms of the stereotypes. It's not really allowing much maneuver for you know for the individual. In the niche world, um, you would never gender anything. Mm -hmm. You'd be it, if you asked, oh, "Is this for men or for women?" It'd be, oh, "Did you really ask that question?" It's like it's <laughs> it'd be like a real faux pas, you know, a bit a bit ghost to do that. Um, the fact is, you don't perfume doesn't need to be gendered at all. You can just wear whatever you want. So when when I discovered that and I crossed the line, I. I think it really changed my whole like enjoyment of it. So this is Burning Bush. This is my uh, alter ego. Uh, so <laughs> I belong to this um, like performance group, uh, like underground kind of cabaret mm -hmm. in in Tokyo, and uh, this entity wears perfumes I would never wear. I mean, I like perfumes that are uh, ambiguous and androgynous. You know, like in, in between. Bernie Bush can wear the, well, this would smell great. Uh, Ch Chuborose Jasmine, very, very strong scented perfume. But I think if people can break through the gender divide, they can open themselves up to, you know, the whole realm of possibilities, really. Right. It's boring just to smell the same as everyone else. It's boring to be generic and just only be limited to one thing. But what do you think about that? Well, it kind of brings me to my next question, and I'm going to quote you again. You've said that perfume is just like wearing your finest outfit of sh or shoes. Your signature perfume can make you feel invincible. Can you talk us through how a person can discover their signature scent and how to wear it? And it doesn't only have to be one, because you're, you're, you're talking about potentially having a, um, a scent wardrobe. Yeah, I think so. I mean, like, I mean, wearing the same thing would be tiring, right? And eventually your nose wouldn't smell it anymore, so it's good to have, like, a different scents for different seasons and different, different times. Um, you know, in winter, I wouldn't wear a, str a strong vanilla amber perfume because it would just smell cloying. But sorry, in summer, I wouldn't wear that. In winter, I would wear that. Um, how can you find it? You, the only way to do it is to explore. I mean, people, people call it going down the rabbit hole. So I met someone earlier, Katrina. Is, is, she, is she here? Yeah, hi. So you, she said that she, she'd read my blog 10 years ago. When she was going down the rabbit hole. Once you go down the rabbit hole, once you go down the rabbit hole, it's a bit dangerous in terms of your wallet because it's not like it's not a cheap hobby, really. You know, like like you can you can test music 
or you know, check out music on YouTube. You can watch a, a trailer of, of a film, but you can't actually really try a perfume unless you physically put it on your skin. So there are two options. You can order online samples, or you can go to department stores or you know, like per perfume boutiques and try them. But once you, the more you get into it, the more set, the more developed your nose becomes, and then after that, you uh, you can't really take me be mediocrity anymore. Once you discover quality in something good, it's hard to go back to dreck, I think. Well, not dreck, but, you know, like rubbish. Uh, <laughs> or, or, sorry, <laughs> banal, banal. Because a lot of, no, no, because I was in England last summer. I hadn't been there for three and a half years because of corona. And the scent culture is very different because in Japan people don't really wear that much. And I think, actually, people are a bit more adventurous in Japan. I think so. Like a lot of women wear quite beautiful, like woody, like hinoki, like on, you know, hot spring onsen kind of soapy smells that wouldn't be considered traditionally feminine. A lot of men wear fruity. The, the hair gels are quite scented. You don't get that kind of typical gender divide. And when I went back to England, it was the opposite. I, I only smelled synthetic vanilla everywhere I went. Mm. All men wearing, you know, standard. And I find it quite, quite. I, I actually find it depressing. It's like it clogs up my mental airway. If I, uh, Another one. Right. Whereas if someone's wearing something intriguing, like I met my friend Emma in Norwich for the day, and she was wearing the same perfume that Prince used to wear, Eau de Sud by Nick Guitar, which is like a citric herbaceous scent with a dark kind of undertone. Perfect on a man, perfect on a woman. I can imagine Prince smelled amazing in it. Yeah. Emma smelled gorgeous in it. It was genuinely sexy. It was like, wow, it's so different from the standard candy floss, you know, what do you call it in Japan? What's, what do you call candy floss in America? The thing you get at the fairground, the sponge. Oh, yeah, we call it fairy floss, but you're calling candy. Fairy yeah. floss? Yeah, don't you call cute. it fairy floss? Oh, that's the Australians call it fairy floss. That's <laughs> candy. Oh, cotton, kind of course, yes, cotton. Yeah, we say uh, candy floss. And I like candy floss, I like, and I like that kind of thing, but it just gets a bit tiring. Mm. It's like always eating ice cream and nothing else. Sometimes you want a salad, you know. So how, how should a person wear their scent? How should they wear it? In what mm. sense? In, in terms of how much? Like physically, where is the best place to put it on? I mean, Coco Chanel said, you know, a woman should wear a perfume wherever she wants to be kissed. Well, that could be a bit dangerous. Um, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, that's, no, no, but that is a good point because I, I think when you, like, in intimate situations, you don't want to, like, physically, take, you know, be eating the perfume. I think it's better if it's, if it's emanating from somewhere. I mean, in, in Japan, people wear it um, traditionally behind the knees, would you believe? So when you're, you, you know, you're at the office and then like, ooh, a little bit's wafting up, but you can't quite, you can't, can't quite tell where it's coming from. Whereas like, uh, <laughs> she wants her knees kissed. No, um, no, no, but like, it, I personally don't think it's, it's good to do this kind of like oil slick to the neck. Because, you know, you meet, and it's like, you know, like, you'd come out in hives straight away. Uh, yes, I would. You have come out in hives it's before, happened. haven't you? I think that, I think the wrists are the best, the classic wrists. But one thing that people always make the mistake of doing is, like, they spray and then rub it. That's seriously wrong, because you're destroying the kind of delicate top notes and the, the way it's meant. it's meant. It's made in a way to evaporate naturally. By doing that, you kind of ruin the effect of it. So don't do that. Um, I think putting it on cotton wool is a good idea. And on, uh, like, I have to circumvent my scent ban at school because I can't follow the rules too much. And I can't sometimes resist putting a, you know, a tissue here or like a piece of fabric there. And it has a, diff it has a more subtle scent to it. I mean, for example, if, if, you're, if you're drenched in perfume and then you have like a sweaty situation or a, like a, a stressy situation, like your, you, your, your stress hormones are going to change. It can really foul. And then you can't get it off. You know, there's no way to get it off you apart from rubbing it. Whereas if you have like a little bit here, and I think rollables are great actually. That's become quite popular. It's a really good idea. Like you rollables. So you like, um, some people, I mean, these days people, people are obsessed with uh, on the scent forums, just like a projection. You know, like it's everything's about you know, it has to be so strong that it lasts for eight hours, and, and no one. You, you, I think it's not the way 
way to do it. If you have a, if you decant your perfume into a roller ball, you can. Let's say you're meeting your friend for lunch and you want to smell nice. You can just do like a tiny, like a, literally a dot is enough sometimes, and that's enough to make you smell nice, but without suffocating the other person. I mean, I've been, I have been influenced by being in Japan because it's not acceptable socially. Right. It really isn't acceptable. And people won't hesitate in holding their nose on the train sometimes. Mm. That oh, I've ever done it. Yeah. You know. Um, I quite appreciate the honesty of it in some ways. It's like, you know, you're selfish, you're stinking up my personal space, you should be respecting my boundaries. I think we should have more of that. I, I think the Japanese way is quite good. I think this um, too strong is not enjoyable, is it? Well, you, obviously for you. Yeah. Would you agree that perfumes are too strong, generally, these days? Not really. Maybe I smell them more, more than most people, so I'm kind of oversensitive to it, but... Um, it should be something which is which isn't like an emanation, like a, like a enigmatic emanation. Like ooh, and it should make you want to, you know, approach the person rather than escape from them. And I often want to escape. So <laughs> I do. Th I really do think that is important. Take notes, please. <laughs> but but I'm. I mean, I'm a hypocrite. I'm. Yeah. I'm like a scent terrorist. <laughs> like, so every, everything I'm saying is rubbish because, uh, like, on weekends, I sometimes I lit, I just. You know, I can't do it during the week, and I go nuts at the weekends. And I can, I'm kind of pretty, pretty hardcore sometimes. So I'm not following my own advice. But just as a general rule of thumb, I mean. So can I ask you, what was the perfume that, that really um, set you on this trajectory in your... So I, I was lucky. My mum my had very good... Has, she's alive, but... She had very good um, taste in scent, and she bought my dad's after aftershaves. Oh, that's one, yeah, one point about being gendered. In England, you can't use the word perfume. I think in America, you can't use the word perfume. Yeah, you have to say cologne, right? Like, uh, we say aftershave. What aftershave are you wearing? Oh, I forgot. I can't remember. You, you have to pretend you're not even wearing it. Anyway, perfumes. Um, my dad and my mum had very good um, scents, and I used to wear all of them. And then, um, but when I was... 16 or 17, Obsession came out. Obsession for men, and uh, it, it's been reformulated since then. So the version you get in the shops now, it's like a pale facsimile of the original. It's still, I mean, Duncan's nephew wears it. Um, but when I, got, when I smelled that original, it was like, I went insane, basically. Um, and I spent all of my, um, at university, I spent like, I mean, I didn't have enough, to eat sometimes. I spent literally, I would get my student loan in the bank account and go straight to the department store. <laughs> and I bought, no, I bought, I would buy the, the perfume, the soap, the talc. They had a liquid talc once, which I remember just like standing naked before a, a student event, just pouring the whole thing over my shoulder. Like, I mean, I absolutely, I, would, I was willingly suffocating on it. And you could smell it from the, like from, apparently you could smell it from the bottom. I, I was living on the fifth floor. And you could smell it from the bottom. But I also, I was complimented a lot as well. I mean, people, people loved it. I mean, I loved it. Well, let's just say, I mean, we had some staff members. <laughs> but I was overdoing it. <laughs> staff, so people in, you know, working here got to read uh, your description of, of obsession that you provided for the Set Appreciation Workshop yeah. for tomorrow. Which what you, did I say this time? They, well, first of all, they really, really want to <laughs> smell it because of how you described it. Oh, really? <laughs> and the insanity that it may have caused you. But this is how, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to read The insanity that it caused you. It made me obsessed, basically. I mean, it, right. it was a good name for it. Uh, the perfume that uh, started me on this obsession, Unleashing Madness. <laughs> The first unapologetically male odalisk, warm, powdered, spiced, this vintage edition, exactly as it smelled when it was released, is the passionate soundtrack of my late adolescence and first years and loves at university where I spent a fair proportion of my allotted funds on Obsession and its ancillary products. Which, which is, is all obviously. completely true. But I think the point with that scent was it was a complete divide with, it wasn't a barbershop uh, brush like fuja it was like it was an amber it was a vanilla it was like a spicy heavy it wasn't feminine but it wasn't masculine I, I just identified with it it's like this is me you couldn't put it into words like in the way that you could like you could say why you loved a movie you could say why you loved a song maybe even but you couldn't say exactly why i couldn't say why i loved it it just totally magnetized me and i wanted to drink it pretty much i feel like scent is very 
Well, it's insanity. intangible. No, I mean, <laughs> insanity is like contagious. Yeah, you're picking it up. <laughs> Sorry, it is a bit mad. All of this, really. But there's an intangible it might, it might aspect to scent, right? Intangible. Yes, that's the beauty of it. That's why it's so exciting to get some success in writing about it. You know, because people have enjoyed the book, and some people like my blog, and like, yes, it's it. It's the challenge of trying to capture something which is ephemeral and is difficult to describe. So I'm fascinated by the link between language and scent. I'm interested at the workshop if people think, actually, what you said doesn't remotely like capture what I'm feeling, smelling. That's quite interesting. You know, like it's like a challenge to me. If I mean, everyone's subjective, so if it doesn't, it's fine. But um, if it does match the emotion, that people, I, I'd be quite excited. If it makes them thrilled in some way, I'll be I'll be pleased. Okay. Thank you so much for being here no, thank tonight, you very Neil. Much. And would before I hand it over, what are you wearing tonight? And can you please describe? Are, are you wearing a scent tonight? A little bit. Okay. But you were, I was, you were coughing in the car. So even that. And he said that he wasn't wearing anything. <laughs> but I thought I couldn't really come here uh -huh. and not have anything at all. It would, it would feel too strange. So I was wearing uh, an orange blossom Neroli kind of floral, which I, which I like, but you obviously didn't. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, to be honest, it could have been Duncan's uh, grape chewing gum because um, no, because some of the chewing gum in Japan is like exceptional. It's like a perfume in itself. So it could have been that you Do you like grape? That's seriously strong. Like one is like enough to kind of surround you. I quite like it. So it was it was a mixture of, of uh, chewing gum and uh, neroli cologne. So I'd like to um, open it up all to right. all of you. Uh, so if you have That's any questions right. for Neil, please you know raise your hand and and ask away. <laughs> yes. Chanel number five. Yeah. I think so. But I wonder, was the, the person who created it and the time she created it and the publicity, did that contribute so much to the popularity? Almost as much as the scent? I mean, it's it could be, but I think there is something really timeless about num I actually wear number five. Like, I've discovered it's gorgeous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What formulation in the parfum or the eau de parfum or the eau de toilette? Because they're quite different. It, I, I is it the spray? Yeah. But the only reason I took was when I was younger, I would, uh, it was Chanel, is it 19? I, that's mine. That that's was, my, That's me. That was my favorite. I wear it. And now uh, the only place is one place in San Francisco I can get it. They just don't make it. Oh, number 19 is very particular. It's, it's very um, silvery and right. very remote. It's aloof. Some people think it smells a bit supercilious, a bit like you're looking down your nose at people. That's right. probably why I like it. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. That is the point. No, that's the point because if something can confer that feeling of like, not, no one wants to feel superior. But if you feel, perhaps if you doubt your own elegance, but you have a, a scent which can give it to you, that's why. But you're asking about number five. I think it's just as good as it used to be, which is why it's continued to sell. And Chanel has their own uh, jasmine and rose. Um, farms in grass in the southern France, they protect that particular oil, which generally does go into the parfum, which, which you were. So when, when the perfume came out, it was, it, it was a, to some extent an accident. And there are different legends surrounding it. It was Ernst de Beau who, who made it for Chanel. She wanted something that didn't smell like flowers, something which was abstract. She wanted it to be very, like, just not of the times, completely new. So they put an overdose of aldehydes in it, which is a chemical which just gives a kind of champagne, like bubbly um, effect. She loved it straight away and said, like, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one. Of course, there was lots of advertising at the time, but I think, I think it literally sold itself. I mean, some perfumes are still around now, like Chalamar and um, Nina Ricci Le Duton, which my aunt wears. They might have been tampered with a little bit, but I think the actual, I think the essence of the scent is what carries it. If something's not very really good, it's not going to last. It doesn't matter how many 
how good your advertising is. So I think it just smells gorgeous, doesn't it? Well, Chanel does smell like Chanel on a lot of different people. With a perfume like beautiful, I, I, people use it and it doesn't smell the same on number A as it does on B. But number five? Awful. <laughs> you don't like beautiful? No. I can, I can understand, it's, it's uh, how can I put it? It's of an era. I actually quite like it. But to, you, you think Chanel smells the same on, on everyone? No. Oh, it doesn't, right? Yes, it does. I, but that's the point because I wear it and it doesn't smell feminine on me at all. I don't think I bring out the kind of deeper ingredients. It doesn't smell like a woman's perfume when I wear it, especially after a couple of hours. But I was at the the, the closet ball where you saw me before, burning bush. I was in the dressing room and I walked in and it was like I almost fainted with desire. I couldn't. <laughs> she she smelt unbelievably gorgeous and it didn't smell old-fashioned at all it's it it is timeless that one it's kind of boring admitting you like that you know you almost want to fight the hype and say actually Chanel number five is rubbish but it's gorgeous so it's the timelessness of the scent itself I think yes yes it's miserable Well, that's very interesting. Um, my mother's had uh, COVID twice. It wasn't long COVID, fortunately. She lost her sense of smell both times. And I researched it. And it did say that uh, using essential oils, that's what perfumers are doing. I mean, if you're a perfumer, it's obviously beyond disastrous if you lose your sense of smell. So they had to um, retrain the, their noses by using very pungent or like piquant essential oils like peppermint, uh, ginger, and so on. So I sent my my mum a, uh, a set of essential oils to try and train the nose back. It's quite difficult to do, but um, yeah, apparently it did it did work. Yeah, I can. I think it's peppermint. You know, she. Could, <laughs> she could, I think. Fortunately, hers came back. Um, I know. T I know two people who lost their smell forever. One had a yeah. One it was a result of surgery, and like an eye surgery, and it did something to the olfactory bulb. Another person had an accident, hit the back of their head, and they lost the sense of smell and taste. And I think life becomes like, I mean, anosmia, like the, the loss of smell, it's been linked to uh, depression, suicidal ideation. It's like, it's like you're not plugged into the world anymore. You know, because when you breathe, like every day you, you breathe around 20, I think it's 23,000 times. Each breath you take in, you're literally taking in the soup of the reality around you and then you're breathing it out. And it's changing every second. So in a way, each breath you take is a unique mixture of scent. And it keep, keeps you, you know, in touch with other people. There's, I think pe people um, don't realize how much it affects you, actually, until it's gone. I mean, in my case, I haven't had that. I'm lucky. But um, when I've had a heavy cold and I've lost my sense of smell, I've almost been relieved. <laughs> If it's two days, it's like, okay, I can just stop thinking about it because I'm always aware of it and it can get tiring sometimes. But I mean, any more than two days would be tragic. Does that answer the question about, about the oils? Yeah. Have you, have you lost your sense of smell? How long has it been? Oh, I mean, I hope it comes back. I really hope so. Yes. Go to an aromatherapist and get this, the most pungent essential oils possible, and it might pierce through something, you know, like, and allow you to begin to distinguish things. But can I just make a point about anosmia? Um, there was a perfumer called uh, Jean Carl. He made um, he made Miss Dior, and he made a uh, Magriff. I think it was 1946, which became a huge bestseller. But he actually composed it anosmically. The same way that you know Beethoven wrote his later music, unable to hear, he actually com he completely lost his sense of smell, and he made the whole thing just from you know his imagination. Like he he knew what he wanted, and he his son was the only person who knew and kept the secret, but he managed to make this perfume. I love it. I wear it. I think it's really fantastic. 
So it's quite amazing that like, an artist like that, you know, can work in flowers and yeah. ingredients. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's gone very quickly. Um, yes, the gentleman there in the back. Oh my God. Incense. Gladly. I absolutely love it. I think it's incomparable. Like, if you're talking about like a, you know, like a sort of hippie joss sticks, which I find, like, they're, it's nothing remotely like Okor, which is like the way of incense. Um, it's exquisite. I mean, I think they do mainly use uh, natural ingredients, and their factories are open for public uh, tours. It's otherworldly, and it just makes you enter a different like, reality. Um, I went to an incense ceremony in Kamakura, where I live. I got invited to like, an incense ceremony on the, the incense shop. Um, but uh, my friend and I were late, which is uh, not acceptable. And also her, <clears throat> her thigh boot got stuck. She was wearing these leather boots. And uh, she was unzipping it. And then as the shoji screen exquisitely opened, we, we tumbled in. And then there were, like, these ladies were sitting you know, with uh, like smelling this piece of agar wood, which was burning. And you had to sit and write a haiku <laughs> about it's just, it was so rarefied and like, I'm, I just felt like a complete buffoon. Um, but, it, but the actual incense itself, I think it's uh, a true art form. I think it's very, very beautiful and I hope it continues. It's the best souvenir to give to people, I think. Not for Christine, but for, um, for uh, <laughs> most people I know in England love it when I bring back you know, a box of incense. And um, they are, it's actually, if you wrap clothes in it, a box of incense. The smell is absolutely divine. It's like a, it's subtly spicy, powdery, and you can get little sachets of uh, like powdered perfume, which you insert into the kimono, and or put in the drawers. And they scent things in the most delicate way imaginable. It's really beautiful. One more question. Is it, how long has it been? <laughs> where, where are we at? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I've got no idea. Okay. okay. Oh. All right, so, all right, last question. I, I think, yeah, yes. Oh my God, all the time. Have you had that experience? Have you had that experience yourself? Which one? I don't know that one, I don't think. I mean, <laughs> uh, I think the only option is eBay, realistically, because if it's been discontinued and it's, if it's remade, it's often not what you want it to be. But then eBay is not 100% reliable, is it? So you're kind of, credit cards a bit sort of, it's a bit dicey. I know, I know. And it can be the real thing and it could have gone off, it could have turned, you know. Um, Are you on Fragrantica? So Fragrantica is, I mean, it's dangerous as a rabbit hole place, but if you go on Fragrantica, which is the encyclopedia of all anything perfume related, you could probably find something which is similar to it. If you, you know, people write about it passionately, they love it. Or there are people who are uh, willing to swap. You could maybe, you know, something they, they want, you might have, you can see. Perfume people are quite generous generally, I find. The perfume community is very, I've loved it. I've met, I've met some really great people through it, and uh, people like sharing it, you know. And uh, I hope you manage to find it. It's happened to me many times. If I like something, it tends to be discontinued because I have a quite weird taste. So, like, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for well, being thank here today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.